Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Halloween. Welcome to the October 2009 virtual user group meeting, which we affectionately call the water cooler. Uh, today we are going to be talking about trust account integration with tabs and how to enter electronic transactions, most notably in accounts payable. And I will be talking about that. Mary Jo will be talking about trust account transaction or trust account integration with tabs. Before we get started, a little housekeeping. You all know where the bathrooms are. I don't have to tell you that. But you will find that on the right-hand side of your screen, maybe covering up mine, maybe not, it depends on how big your screen is, there's a box that looks something like this. It has a little box jutting off to the left with some icons in it. The top icon, when you get ready to, will allow you to click it and shove this big box out of the way so that if it is covering up the screen, you can get it out of the way and still have access to it because once you click this, it will turn into two arrows that point then to the left and clicking it a second time will cause this box to come back. And you may want this box to come back if you're shy. If you're not shy and you have a question, you'll click this little icon here that looks like a hand with an arrow pointing up. That means you're going to raise your hand. And when we see that, uh, we will unmute you and ask you what your question is. You'll ask it, and then we'll mute you again and hopefully answer your question. If you're feeling shy, you can instead come here and type a question right here, and we'll see that, and we'll just answer it. And we won't have you talk. We'll just answer your question. So if everybody will go ahead and slide this out of the way. You do it by clicking this. I'm going to do it by clicking this. And we are now ready for Mary Jo to talk about trust integration with tabs 3. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to cover a topic here uh, about trust accounts. Um, a lot of times uh, you're paying yourself uh, for attorney fees or things like that from trust, and you may either be cutting a check or you might be processing it through an electronic funds transfer to transfer money from the trust to your general account. Um, usually what happens in that process then, you go ahead into tabs and you, you cut your check for you know, whatever the amount is to pay your attorney fees to yourself, and then you take that check over into tabs when you're processing your deposit, and then you manually enter a payment entry over there, um, and then you go ahead and you take that um, deposit to the bank. Uh, what I'm going to show you is that there is a way to go ahead and do all of that in tabs, and then to also just show that at the bottom of the bill. So the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to come into the trust account um, like you normally do to write your check. Um, and the difference here that we're going to do is we have to set up two different things here. We need to set up a special payee so that you can pay yourself. And then we also need to set up the uh, payment codes that you use over in tabs so that the payment will go over there properly. So to do that, I'm going to go into our setup screen uh, in trust. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a special payee. Um, when you want to pay yourself, we create a payee called firm. And there is one in here already, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to choose that to show you what it looks like. And instead of putting in your firm name, the actual name of the firm, you just type firm. You can put in the address, uh, all of that, your federal ID number. If you do 1099s and you need to keep track of that, you can put the correct box. And then once you have that payee set up, you go ahead and you save it. The second thing that you need to do before you can integrate this into tabs is to set up your bank account. And we'll go in and we'll just say we're going to use bank account two. If you have more than one bank account, you'll have to set up each of those bank accounts individually. Um, but down here at the bottom, you'll see there's a tab three transaction code for payments. And what you want to do is if you're using the regular payment option where you just have one payment code and you let tabs go ahead and take care of splitting it between fees, expenses, and advances, you go ahead and you put that regular payment code that you're using. Your firm could have 900, it could have 300, it could have 400, it, whatever you set it up for your regular payment code, you go ahead and you put that in here. Now, if you are still doing the old school way where you're actually splitting uh, your fees, advances, and expenses manually with separate fee codes for, or payment codes for each one, you're going to want to go ahead and enter that in um, if you have a special, you know, maybe it's 901 for fees, 902 for expenses, and 903 for advances, you'll have to individually put each of those fees, expenses, and advance codes here. Once you've got that done, you go ahead and you save it. And now when I come in to do my actual check, I have some options here that are available. Let's say that I want to come in and I'm going to choose, who do we have, Marcus Phillips here. 
and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do a check. And I'll do this for $1,000. Oops. And now when I come down here to payee, again, I'm not going to type my firm name. I'm going to type firm. I hit tab, and it knows that that's the payee. And now once I've done that, I can actually come up here, and this tab 3 tab is now available. If I haven't set up any of that information before, this is not available. If I click on it, it's grayed out. I can't get to the screen. But since I have set up my firm and I have set up my payment codes, now I've got this tab 3 screen where I can verify the amount. Now it is necessary if you want this to go ahead and integrate over into tabs to verify this. You have to click on this tab 3 tab. Look at this amount here. It's $1,000 for a regular payment. I'm going to let tab split it up how it needs to be. Or again, if you're using the fee expense advances, you're going to want to double check that the amount of the fees, advances, and expenses that you're taking over to tabs is correct. Once that's done, you go up here and you go ahead and save it. And now I have a check over here. Now I'm going to go back in and I am going to give it a manual check number because we're not actually printing a check. So I want to make sure that I've saved it as an actual payment. Okay, so now that that's done, I'm going to save. And I did do this. <laughs> let, me, let me double check, I think, when I went out. Let me save it. Okay. So it will tell you, you notice that that box came up that I must review the tab 3 information if I want it to go over. So it's going to remind you that you have to go to that tab 3 tab. So now I'm going to go into tabs. And I'm going to bring up Marcus Phillips. And I'm going to go ahead and let me see if I can, I probably will have to refresh this. And now you can see that my payment for $1,000 is over here waiting to be put onto the bill. Okay, so if I go ahead and I generate a draft statement and I preview it, we'll see all of his previous balance and his activity. And then down here at the bottom, scroll down here, we'll see there's his retainer balance. Whoops, too far, sorry. <laughs> okay, opener retainer balance was that amount. Now we can see that we have his payment in there and we can also see that there's his closing retainer balance. And then up here, you can also see that that payment is showing up on his bill. So I didn't have to come over and manually enter my check. It's already there. And everything is on there and ready to bill. Now, if you're not seeing that trust information down at the bottom of your statement, um, you have to actually set that up in the client. And when you go into the client and you go to your statement options, you can see that there is a trust integration button here. And if you don't have this turned on, that trust information will not show up on the bottom of the bill. So you have three different options. You can do a detail, a summary, or none. Um, and so if you want to integrate, you can do it. If you don't, you don't have to. But, um, and then you can do the minimal or the maximum amount of information that you want. Uh, if you've got this and you, you, know, you just start using this and you have not set up that integration and you want to go ahead and get uh, everybody set up on that, there are some other customization settings that you'll have to make um, so that all new clients will go ahead and have that trust detail turned on and then you'll have to go back into client options and then also change uh, those settings so that all your old clients then now have it turned on as well. Are there any questions about how to get the payment from trust into tabs? One other thing I want to make note of, um, if you're using, uh, you know, when you enter your payments for the day or for the week or whenever you're going to go to the bank and you're using that payment verification list to keep track of the total um, uh, amount of payments that you put into the bank and you want that to equal your deposit, just be aware that whenever you do a trust integration, that payment's going to come over with that date on it. So I did it for today. It's going to come in as today's date. And when I do my verification for today, it's going to show up on that payment verification. So be careful if you don't want that, you know, that money's not actually going in the bank that day. You want to do it a different day to date it accordingly. But that, that will show up on that verification list. Okay? Any questions? Okay, Paul, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. I am going to talk about electronic transactions. Some people do them, some people don't. Well, everybody has them. It's just a matter of whether or not you're putting them into the accounts payable system. If you're not reconciling your checking account, then perhaps you've never thought about doing this, but anybody who's ever tried to reconcile their checking account in GL, 
uh, knows that they have to have the twelve dollars that the bank charges you each month to have your account or if you have a partner that's got a debit card and he goes to Luigi's and eats lunch with a client and puts it on that debit card, that's an electronic transaction. There is no check, uh, but it is going to show up and is going to need to be reconciled. Um, so some of you are probably already doing this, but may still pick up a pointer or two. Uh, electronic transactions are entered in the same way that a regular check is only it's a manual check. So let's say that we do have a partner that went to, uh, I believe it's called Luigi's Gastrointestinal, Gastrointestinal Delight, yes, and ate lunch, and the lunch was $50. Um, so we're going to enter a new transaction, no voucher number, no invoice number. Invoice date might be uh, four days ago when the transaction took place. We're now just looking at our online banking and seeing this, so we're entering it. Uh, it, as you know, the description defaults to the last one you used for this, so we'll just leave it at Bob Lunch with Partners, and we'll say that the amount was $50. Uh, the First National Bank is the bank. Now, here's the, the kicker. You're not writing a check, and it's not a manual check in that an attorney took a blank check to the courthouse and wrote a check by hand, but it is what we call a manual check in that the system will not be printing this check. This check will be coming... Uh, directly in and has already been produced or already been encountered or already been uh, expended. Uh, this, this amount at Luigi's is already gone from your bank account. There's no check that needs to be produced. So here's the kicker, the check number. And this is what throws a lot of people. Of course, you don't want to use a check number from your scheme of things, from your regular check number sequence, because you're going to be using that to write a regular check. Um, what we recommend is that you use the date. So let's say today is the 27th, because it is. I would put that in like this, 091027, and then I would add 01. Now, let's talk about the 01 for a second. Um, you probably are thinking, I don't really want to reuse a check number, even if it's for an electronic transaction, and that's right, and we'll talk about that in a second. So this does create a situation where if you have multiple people doing this, um, I, I see most of the people that are here today, with a couple exceptions, are from smaller firms, so it's probably one person doing this. But if you're in a department where you've got three different people that could be making accounts payable entries, you need to know who's used what check numbers for what electronic transactions. And I recommend some sort of either a centrally located log or uh, some sort of a centrally, lo centrally located document on the network, either a handwritten log or a document on the network. Now, I hate to even say handwritten log when we're talking about an electronic uh, computerized accounting system. So uh, what we use here is a document on the network that we simply pull up and kind of reserve that number. So we would now know the next person that goes to write a manual transaction for today would know that 01 has been used and they should use 02 and then they would reserve that number. Now, why do I do it 09 instead of 102709? Why do I do 091027? Uh, that's a sorting thing. Um, if you want these ultimately to then be sorted by date, uh, you want the year to be the first thing that's listed because you'll want them to come out in year order. You wouldn't want all the manual transactions, uh, if you were sorting them by check number, to come out with all the Octobers together for 2007, then 2008, then 2009, and then go to all the Novembers for 2007, 2008, 2009. You would want all the 2007 together, then all the 2008, then all the 2009. This way of arranging the date accomplishes that. Um, whether or not you need an 01 at the end or just a 1, that's up to you. We use 01, and we never write more than 3 electronic transactions in a day. So even though we don't go beyond that uh, need for a single digit, we still put the two digits in because as soon as we stop doing it that way, I'm sure we'll run into a day where we have 10 electronic transactions. Now, why do you need this separate number? Why can't we just use 091027 for the each of the three electronic transactions that we're recording for today? Well, if you go to reconciliation, they'll still all show up as separate entries. They'll all have the same number, but of course you can look at the amounts. One's for $7.28, one's for $12, and one's for $50. So that doesn't really cause a problem. But the real reason to have a significant number here, a distinct and significant number here is, if you go later 
to void one of these transactions, if you do not have a distinct check number and you go to void check number 091027 and that's represented by three transactions, guess what? You're voiding all three and you've got to re-enter the two that you didn't mean to void. That is the primary reason for having this 01, 02, 03, 04 at the end. Okay? Date paid is going to default to today. My demo system, by the way, thinks today is 11-17-09. That's why it keeps popping up with that. So we're going to change that also to the same day as the due date and the invoice date. And then the rest is pretty much the way you're used to it. You, you go over and you uh, uh, put it in the appropriate category or the appropriate account in general ledger. If appropriate, once you save that, you bill it to the client and you're done. <clears throat> so really, the only thing you're doing differently here is you are, of course, making these transactions uh, from your bank statement, from your electronic uh, online banking information, from whatever means you have, and you are using a distinct check number here in order to be able to, uh, if need be, to avoid that transaction later on. Everything else is pretty much the same. Now, one thing that I typically forget to do when I get out of here and I delete my verification list or print it, whatever it is that I'm doing, I usually forget to do this. Uh, when we write checks, we have checks, and the checks are sitting on our desk, and we get out of the soft, the, the one routine, the screen for entering invoices, and we say, oh, we've got to post these checks. I almost invariably forget to post the electronic transactions, so when I get over to GL to reconcile, they're not there, but I just need to come back and do that. So you do need to remember to post those transactions, and uh, then they will go over to GL just as a regular check would. Now I see that we have one question from a shy person. Let's see here. I didn't press the right button. How do I do this, Mary Jo? Um, it, it's just, uh, Kathy's asking, what is the benefit of making an entry this way versus entering a journal entry? Oh, well, for one thing, you can see everything in accounts payable. Sometimes people like to be able to see how many times have we gone to Luigi's for lunch? Or how many times have we, uh, what, what's all the, ex, uh, the expenses that we've had related to the bank account, like the, the service charge, the $12 service charge each month? So they want to be able to look at this information in, um, in the accounts payable system. Also, uh, help me, Mary Jo, I'm pretty sure that accounts payable is where the 1099s are printed. So if there's anything that's being paid by an electronic transaction that's relating to a 1099, you're going to want to have the transaction over here instead of in GL. And, and probably most important, um, Kathy likes GL and likes journal entries, and, and I know a lot of people that do, don't get me wrong, but I also know a lot of people that have absolutely no idea how a journal entry is formatted, how it's structured, what a double entry journal entry means, what debits and credits are, how they, you know, what, what, which is a debit, which is a credit, and what, you know, a negative debit to the bank account is going to increase the, a debit to the bank account is going to increase the balance, a <laughs> credit to the bank account is going to, a lot of people don't understand that. So they simply would prefer to come over here and look at it as, we gave this person this much money, we gave this person this much money. It, it makes more sense from a training standpoint, and from a lot of people's perspective, it, it's just easier to do. Um, the other benefit, too, is let's say that you were you have an electronic um, fund transfer or an automatic debit or credit that comes out of your bank account for maybe a line of credit or a loan or something like that. This gives you the ability to go ahead and put it in AP ahead of time. You don't have to check the manual checkbox until you're ready to actually pay it. Um, you can enter it in with that date, um, and then when it is time to pay, um, you can go ahead and check the manual entry, put your dates in, and then post it. Um, but it will then show up on your cash requirements report. So when you're going to head out and, you know, printing that cash requirements report, here you have your list of all of your checks that you have to write with all your invoices, but then you've also got all your automatic payments over there as well, so it all figures into your balance and what you actually need to pay out. Good point. So that works really well as, um, as well. Okay. And Bill has a question, so we're going to unmute him. Bill, what's your question? Uh, this is actually on the other side of the coin. Um, we frequently get uh, electronic funds transfers from our overseas clients. So I'm posting them as payments in tabs and integrating with uh, GL that way. But invariably, the originating bank charges a fee. 
and we accept the uh, the payment reduced by that fee as the a total payment for that client. So uh, what I've been doing is then going into GL after each of these payments and creating a uh, credit to the bank account and a debit to bank fees uh, so that the uh, statement reconciles with that reduced payment amount mm -hmm. uh, and tabs clears the client of its obligation. But I can't tie that to the deposit um, record for the day because it's a credit transaction in the bank account. And I was wondering if you had a tip or a trick for uh, tying those together. Mary Jo and I are looking at each other. Uh -huh. We normally don't get to look at each other because we work in different offices, but today we're in the same room. Um, one thing that comes to my mind is that because you're actually reducing the amount of money that you're collecting from the client, you're making it look in tabs. Let's say you got $1,000 for the sake of discussion. You're making it look like uh, uh, the attorney that did the work is getting paid for $1,000 worth of time when, in fact, they're getting paid kind of a reduced amount. One thing that I would look at doing, and I'm not sure this is one of those where Mary Jo and I would probably think about this for several minutes and maybe talk about it, but off the top of my head, I would create an, some sort of an entry on the bill to reflect that $20 fee, let's say it's a $20 fee, and then I would write down the attorney's time by $20 to $980. And I would do this um, probably just prior to um, posting the payment and then would produce a final bill that would push all that over and then the payment if we set up the integration for payments correctly would push it over to GL the right way that's a thought right off the top of my head because what you're doing instead is going in after the fact which is good for record keeping but as you say makes reconciliation difficult I think that if we approached it from a standpoint of um, making an adjustment to the statement before we push the payment through and letting tabs know that that's what we're doing and therefore letting tabs push it over to GL correctly, um, then once it gets to GL, it's already right and therefore is going to reconcile right. Now, I'm kind of trying to picture this as I'm talking, and sometimes for me that's difficult. Um, so Mary Jo is, is, is writing things. I don't know if she's writing a note to check on this. Yeah, I think I want to check on it a little bit further, Bill, to make sure it works. You know what that means? You know, that's a polite, her polite way of saying that she doesn't think what I said is going to work, and she's oh. probably got a better idea. Am I still unmuted? No, you're here. Um, the, um, that would work. It would be a write-down as opposed to uh, actually recording the amount of the fee from the bank and um, would transfer then the correct amount to GL from tabs. And would reflect, mm -hmm. not positively, actually negatively, but correctly on the attorney's actual collected um, revenue. Uh, you want to show in tabs, um, you know, when that client writes that check, it's minus that fee, is that correct? Or when that client pays you, because the fee is... But, well, yeah, what happens is they tell their bank to send us $1,000, mm -hmm. and the bank minus fees. And uh, yeah, the bank so says, in order for us to sends us nine hundred and eighty dollars, we we record that as payment in full for the uh, out right. invoice. And, but and there's actually a twenty dollar discrepancy. Right, and then what you're saying is that that client actually got paid for the thousand, even though you know they were only you know actually paid for like maybe although we yeah we only received nine hundred and eighty. The client was billed a thousand, but the bank took twenty of that. Yeah. I, I would I think Paul's on the right track there with writing down the fee amount and then adding a, a twenty dollar expense for the, the fees. And what you're doing then if the client has no idea, they don't see this, you probably don't even print the final bill, uh, but you're you're doing what we might call a blind final, meaning you're doing a final after you've made this adjustment to make it take. Um, and, and by blind I mean the client's not seeing it and, and by saying you display it meaning you probably don't even print it. And then when you update, it's going to go through to GL correctly because at that point, 
TABS knows what's going on. The problem with the way you're doing it is that TABS doesn't know what's going on. And it works, but it makes reconciliation difficult. And more importantly, in my mind, it makes, um, by TABS being out of the picture, it makes the attorney seem like they earned, you know, it's a minimal amount. It's a cost of doing business, but it makes the attorneys uh, take or uh, a share or, or a contribution to that money coming in uh, okay. a little inflated, inflated by the $20. Mm -hmm. And since it's my brother Dave who's the attorney, God knows we don't want to inflate his uh, worth. In fact, he's the one that we tease all the time, so uh, we want to make sure that his worth is, is negated to whatever extent is possible. Oh, did you get the email? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I understand Dave hit a deer in my daughter's brand new car. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we're, with that, we're going to uh, look and see if we have any more questions, which we don't. So, and of course, I'll ask if we have a lawyer joke. Rachel, didn't you say you were going to have a lawyer joke this time when I asked you? I have a lawyer joke. Does everybody know how copper wire was made? How was copper wire made, Mary Jo? Two attorneys were fighting over a penny. <laughs> <laughs> it's a clean lawyer joke, it's no less. Lawyer, lawyer. There aren't many of those. They're a rarity. Okay, well, that does it then. We are done with our October 2009 virtual user group meeting. Happy Halloween, everyone, and have a good afternoon. Oh, wait a minute. I am supposed to tell you that our topics for next month, it is our year-end what to do at the year end uh, extravaganza. extravaganza, if you will. We are going to go over uh, things that we've gone over before, but we like to do this every year. Uh, all the things you need to know about year end in GL and accounts payable and trust accounting and, and tabs three, uh, including how to make a complete historical backup, what reports to run at year end, how to backup uh, your GL client, uh, what knowledge base articles to read if you're, if you're into knowledge base articles, and what checks to void, very important to remember that certain checks should be voided if they're a certain age. So that will be next month. We will send you a reminder and an invitation the Thursday before at 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So everybody have a good month, and we will see you in a month. Thanks much.